Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, I'm here to do my ranking of all of Riley Sager's books. <music> So if you have been with my channel for any length of time, you will know that I am a Riley Saker stan. Even though I find some of his books very hit or miss, overall I still feel like he's a very talented thriller writer and he has just the capabilities of writing a really engaging and page-turning thriller book. And I actually just recently completed Middle of the Night a few days ago, which is his newest release, and so I have now officially read all of the books that he has written under Riley Sager. So I thought it would be fun to come on here and rate my Riley Sager experience from least favorite to favorite. I know that there are a lot of people out there like me who read everything that Riley Sager writes and they have very different opinions on the books that they love versus the books that they don't. So I wanted to just come on here and share my experience with Riley Sager and I'm very interested to see what your opinions are on each and every one of his books. So like I said, we are going to go ahead and start with my least favorite Riley Sager all the way up to my favorite Riley Sager. And I would say that to this day, my least favorite Riley Sager still goes to the first Riley Sager that I ever read and that was Final Girls. I went into this book extremely hyped. By the time that I read Final Girls. I believe that he had published at least two or three other novels and I had all of them in the book of the month editions on my shelves. It just seemed like this man was going to be the perfect thriller author for me based on the synopses of his stories and this book was getting a lot of hype. So needless to say the expectations were high. I gave this a 2.5 out of 5 stars and I had so many issues with it and it was just further compounded by the fact that I was so disappointed because I had such high expectations. So this book follows our main character Quincy and she is a final girl and that's basically a charming term that the media has created to describe the lone survivor of a massacre. And in this story, Quincy is one of only three final girls. She actually knows the other two, Lisa and Sam. And then when Lisa ends up dead, that understandably shakes up Quincy and things are further exacerbated when Sam shows up on her doorstep. Quincy is very distrustful of Sam. She doesn't know what is happening, but there is this sense of dread, like maybe somebody is coming after them and they are next on the list. And it kind of goes from there. Now, I would say that my biggest complaint with this story is that in some ways, I feel like it was misrepresented. When I read the synopsis, of this. I thought that there was going to be a very big survival aspect to this story, right? We have three final girls, one of them is dead, two of them are left, and then the two other final girls have to kind of pair up to survive because somebody is coming after them. Somebody is killing final girls, right? So I expected this to be a very tense, suspenseful time, and that is not what I got. Because as soon as Sam showed up on Quincy's doorstep, I would say like 75% of this was just a back and forth between Sam and Quincy. Quincy is obviously very distrustful of Sam. Sam is compounding this because she has mentioned absolutely nothing about herself. She doesn't really answer any of Quincy's questions. And she is constantly pushing Quincy to return back to the night of Quincy's own survival through the massacre that she endured. It's clear that Sam is very much a bad influence. She is trouble. And I felt like the majority of this book was just that back and forth between Sam and Quincy, because at the same time, even though Quincy was distrustful of Sam, she was also like consistently defending Sam. So I just really had a hard time with their relationship. I had a hard time caring about their relationship because that's not what I wanted from this story. I also found the two major twists in the story to be fairly predictable and that further aggravated me because ultimately there was like zero payoff for my trouble here. It didn't deliver on its promises. It was fairly predictable and for the life of me I could not understand why this book was so damn popular, like why it was getting all of the praise. And to be fair it was like a miracle that I decided to continue with him as an author. But like I said I think at that point I had two other books by him on my shelves and so I was definitely going to give him another chance and I'm so grateful that I did because nothing has really compared to my ultimately negative experience that I had with this one. But yeah, this was just a dud for me. Then I would say my second to last favorite Riley Sager book is The House Across the Lake. So this follows our main character, Casey Fletcher, and she's an actress who is undergoing some bad press. She's definitely blown up her career a little bit. And also she's recently lost her husband. So she is a widow. So she's going through a lot and she's kind of imploding. She's drinking all the time. She's got a lot of bad press going on. So in order to escape this, she is being sent to her family's lakeside cabin in Vermont. And in order to entertain herself, you know, outside of all of the booze, she has taken to spying on her neighbors across the lake, Tom and Catherine Royce, via binoculars. They live in this like stunning glass house. She can see everything that is going on. And one day she is out on the lake. I believe she is canoeing or rowing or something like that. And she witnesses Catherine almost drown. And so she saves Catherine and it strikes up a friendship between the two. And one day Catherine kind of goes missing. She doesn't know where Catherine is. She hasn't heard from her. Catherine's husband is being less than helpful. And so Casey kind of takes it upon herself to find out what happened to Catherine. And it goes from there. Now, first, I want to express a grievance that I had with this that really had nothing to do 
with the plot or the writing or anything about the book itself. It was a narrator that they chose to narrate the audiobook. Our main character in this was, I would say, mid to late 30s, and they chose an audiobook narrator that was clearly much older. I would say late 50s, early 60s. She wasn't necessarily like a bad narrator. There was nothing inherently wrong about the way that she was narrating the story, but her voice did not fit the character. So just as you can have a narrator who doesn't narrate well, the wrong narrator can also impact your experience with the book. And that definitely happened here. I wouldn't necessarily say that it took a lot of enjoyment away from my reading experience. Riley Sager did that all on his own with this one, but it definitely didn't help. So I would be wary of that if you plan on listening to this via audio. I would say if you can avoid it, do because they just picked the wrong narrator. And I also want to touch upon the fact that I know a lot of people's main grievance with this was the fact that Riley Sager used some very overdone tropes at this point, right? We have an unreliable narrator. She's unreliable because she's a lush. She's a drunk. And of course, she thinks that she witnesses something in her neighbor's house that she's spying on, but nobody really believes her because of course she's a drunk. You know, we see this all the time. This is the girl on the train. This is the woman in the window. Like it happens. It's overdone. So I completely acknowledge that grievance and it's completely valid, but that's really not what bothered me about the story because I think that those tropes are overdone for a reason and that they can be done well. However, it was the excessive mention of booze and drinking in this that really started to aggravate me. We get it, right? She's a drunk. She loves to drink, but it seemed like every other sentence Riley Sager was mentioning that she had a drink in her hand, that she was going to have a drink, blah, blah, blah. He was really pushing this to make you as the reader distrust the narrator. And so that was getting a little bit frustrating. But again, that still wasn't even really what pushed me over the edge into the lack of enjoyment for this book. And I can't even really tell you what that was because it would be a major spoiler for this. All I will just say is that if you've read a lot of Riley Sager, you will know that there's a common situation that happens in his books where it has an opportunity to go in one of two directions. And typically he goes in this direction, but in this book, he actually veered and went into another direction. And I don't think that it worked. I know that there are a lot of people who actually really appreciated that he finally took the leap and went into the opposite direction, but I didn't. I couldn't suspend my disbelief enough in this, even though I did find it really creative and clever. It just ultimately did not work for me. So sadly, even though this is one of his newer releases that came out, I want to say like three years ago, this is currently one of my least favorite books by him. Now, I would say that these next two books are tied. And the reason I say that is because these are the two that I remember the least about. I've mentioned this before on my channel, but even though I consider three stars to be a very versatile rating, and I tend to have two different meanings behind three star ratings, ultimately, the one thing that they have in common is that the books are probably going to be pretty forgettable. And that's the case with these. Like I rated both of these a solid three stars, and I overall had a decent reading experience with them, but there was nothing super fantastic about them to make them memorable in my mind. So these are the two that I remember the least about. However, if I had to choose one to go next, I would say it would be Lock Every Door. So this follows our main character, Jules, and she's kind of going through a lot of difficult things in her life. She's broke. She's recently gone through a breakup. So she thinks it might be too good to be true when she's offered kind of an apartment sitting job at the Bartholomew, which is this very prestigious, high profile building in Manhattan. And it doesn't really bother her that there are a lot of very strict rules that come from apartment sitting. Like you can't have any visitors at all. You can't spend any nights away from the apartment, but she's totally willing to do it because she's going to have accommodations in this beautiful building. She's going to be paid very, very well for it. And so she really has no complaints. And as she continues to apartment sit, Jules gets to know Ingrid, a fellow apartment sitter. And Ingrid kind of lets Jules know that the Bartholomew is not really what it appears to be. And then suddenly Ingrid goes missing. And so you're following Jules as she's trying to uncover what happened to Ingrid and also try to uncover the secrets of the Bartholomew. Ultimately, I really just don't have much to say about this because like I said, I don't remember. I just remember the twist at the end, finding it to be fairly underwhelming and very, very mediocre. I would say that what was going on was sinister in its own right, but I was expecting a, something a little bit more evil, a little bit more dark and disturbing than what I got from this story. And that's really all that I remember about it. It was fine. This is a book and I read it and it didn't really leave a lasting impression with me. This next one slightly ekes out over Lock Every Door because there are definitely more instances in this book that I remember than I did with Lock Every Door and that is Survive the Night. Now I will say that this is probably consistently one of the most hated Riley Sager books. Almost everybody I know that read this book really didn't enjoy it but for the most part I remember my overall reading experience was decent. I would say I had a much more positive time reading this than I did with Lock Every Door. So this is actually set firmly in the 90s. It's set in 1991 and it's following our main character Charlie Jordan and she is attending college in New Jersey and she is desperate to get back to Ohio. She's desperate to get away from her New Jersey campus because her best friend has recently been killed by a serial killer that is being known as the campus killer. So she needs to get away and using her campus rideshare program she comes in contact with a man named Josh who she doesn't know but he is heading in her direction and so they team up they get in the car and they go and it doesn't really take long for Charlie to become suspicious of Josh. She really knows nothing about him and she starts to kind of uncover holes in his story. And when she catches him in outright lies, 
realize she realizes that she's in trouble and she's now in a fight for her life. And so what I really enjoyed about this is that it became a cat and mouse game and it did so on these dark rural roads where they were all alone. It was very sinister. It was very, very atmospheric. And like I said, because it's set in 1991, you don't have the cell phones, you don't have the internet, you don't have an easy way to contact for help. So that was one of my favorite parts about this. But I did have a lot of technical flaws with the story. First and foremost, it was entirely predictable. I predicted who the campus killer was by page nine of the story. So by page nine, you have met the campus killer. And I'm so sorry for the spoiler there, but I think it was so patently obvious that you probably already knew that already. Now, in some ways, I also think that because it was so predictable, Riley Sager definitely had to take this in a really unusual direction, which he did. I don't think that that was very clear cut at all, the direction that he took this story. I think it was really unusual for the most part, and I didn't mind it. But there was a confusing and unbelievable part of our main character in that she said that she experiences movies in her head. It's almost like daydreaming. She will kind of retreat into her mind and these movies will play out very, very vivid, clear movies. It's almost like she's no longer there present with you. You could be talking to her and she wouldn't hear you at all. And this ultimately ended up happening because after she lost her parents, she would lose herself in actual movies and then it just started to kind of happen in her head. And so there are portions in this story that you don't know at first whether she's experiencing a movie in her mind or if it is actually happening. And I had a hard time with that. Now, I am not a medical expert, so I have no idea if this is actually a phenomenon that exists. I don't know if this actually happens to people as a coping mechanism or what have you. All I know is that in this story, it was only introduced to make Charlie an unreliable narrator. Like, is Josh really as suspicious as she thinks he is? Or were certain moments just things that she imagined in her mind? I don't know. It just added overall something negative to the reading experience for me. And so, like I said, while I felt like this was a decent reading experience, it was a good time. It was a page turning time. I feel like there were a lot of thrillers that did the forced proximity trope a lot better than this one did, but I do feel like this was very atmospheric. And for that alone, I would say it could be worth the read. All right. And so next I would actually place his newest release, Middle of the Night. So this follows our main character, Ethan Marsh. And when he was 10 years old, he was camping in the backyard with his best friend, Billy. And when he woke up, Billy was gone. He was taken and nobody ever knew what happened to him. And of course, Ethan suffered some severe PTSD after this. It is now 30 years later. He is in his 40s. He's plagued by bad dreams, nightmares, and insomnia. And he is actually returning to his childhood home. His parents have retired. They moved to Florida. They need somebody to help with the house. And he goes ahead and takes him up on the offer to move back in. And he also kind of needs to face what actually happened to Billy Wright. But almost as soon as he returns home, mysterious things start to happen. He starts to sense Billy's presence. And he thinks that Billy is there in some form, maybe not physically, but spiritually. And this actually prompts Ethan to continue to look into Billy's disappearance. And he actually ends up reuniting with friends that he grew up with who were around at the time of Billy's disappearance. And it goes from there. This again, I would say is another semi-decently atmospheric story. I don't think it was nearly as atmospheric as Survive the Night, but I know a lot of people who read this really felt the chilling atmosphere in here. I didn't. I, for the most part, found this to be an enjoyable reading experience just because of the character-driven nature of it. You can really uncover how haunted Ethan was, but ultimately some other aspects in this story were just kind of okay. They really didn't work for me. Apparently there was like some mysterious institute that kind of dealt with the occult, and he was thinking that that was the reason that Billy disappeared. And ultimately the reveal was just very lackluster and mundane overall. So I think I settled on a 3.5 star for this, but I did actually really like the ending of the story overall. So for the most part, it was fine. It definitely wasn't the worst Riley Sager, but in my opinion, it certainly wasn't the best either. All right. And now we are getting into my very top three Riley Sagers. So number three is definitely going to have to be The Last Time I Lied. And I'm going to be completely honest and say that it was the ending of this book that really cemented it as a favorite of mine. I did not see the ending of this one coming at all. And all I remember thinking after this book ended was, well done, Mr. Sager. Well done. I just thought that it was phenomenal. So this follows our main character, Emma Davis. And when she was 15 years old, she was attending a summer camp. She was staying in a cabin with three other girls. And then one night, all three of those girls goes missing, never to be seen again. Nobody knows what happens to them. The summer camp was shut down. Everybody moved on with their life, except for Emma, who is now like growing in the New York City art scene. And she kind of incorporates her past into the paintings. And these paintings actually catch the attention of Francesca, who was the owner of Camp Nightingale, which is the camp where the girls went missing. And she tells Emma that she actually plans to reopen Camp Nightingale. And she wants Emma to come and be an art instructor at the camp. And of course, Emma is very hesitant to return to a place where such terrible things happen, but she's going to kind of use it as a way to not just get closure, but also try to figure out what actually happened to these three girls. And so she gets to camp and it doesn't really take long for her to realize that something is not right here. There are some mysterious, crazy things that are happening. And it is really just about her journey, trying to uncover what happened to these three women. And honestly, I just had such a great time with this book. And like I said, it was the ending. The ending truly did it for me. This definitely gives you some of those same similar vibes as you do get watching those horror flicks. You know, they're at a summer camp, Friday 
Friday the 13th takes place at a summer camp. You never know what is going to happen. It seems like so many terrible things happen at summer camps. You have no idea what actually happened to these three women. You have no idea who to trust. Everybody is a suspect. I would say in this one, if I remember correctly, Emma is not an unreliable narrator. And I always appreciate that. Like I don't necessarily dislike an unreliable narrator, but I like going into it knowing that I can trust the narrator and she is just as confused as we are. And we are learning things with her and we're uncovering the mystery. And so I kind of felt like that was the case in the last time I lied. I thought that he did a great job with the ending of the story. And so because of that, I don't think that this could ever not remain in a top three, no matter how many books he releases, but I guess we'll see. All right. And then my second favorite Riley Sager, I think to this day is still Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. So this follows our main character, Maggie Holt. And when she was just five years old, she and her parents moved into Bainberry Hall, which was in a stately Victorian manor in rural Vermont. And unbeknownst to them, this is a house with a history. It is a house that remembers. And it doesn't take long for very sinister things to start happening in the house. And just 20 days after they moved in, they hastily depart. They leave everything behind and they basically run for their lives away from their house. And the Maggie's father actually goes on to write a best-selling novel about their experiences in this house. And the present perspective is 25 years later and Maggie wants absolutely nothing to do with this book. To be quite honest, she thinks her father is full of crap. She doesn't remember anything that he mentioned in his book and she thinks that it's entirely false. And when her father passes away, he actually leaves her the keys to Bainberry Hall, which is a complete surprise to her because she had no idea that he even still owned the house. And in this story, if I remember correctly, she's kind of like a house flipper. She goes in and she renovates and sells houses. And so that's her plan with Bainberry Hall. But also at the same time, she's using her return to Bainberry Hall as a way to kind of uncover the truth. And of course, as she's returning to Bainberry Hall, she too starts to experience some sinister otherworldly things. So this was actually the book that I read after Final Girls. So this was my second experience with Riley Sager. And thankfully it was so, so much better. This was another extremely atmospheric book. Sager did a really great job of setting the scene, give you all of the spooky vibes. And he did a great job of making you question if what was happening was actually paranormal or not. And that's typically a line that he toes in a lot of his books. I also really liked the formatting of this book because this alternates between Maggie's present day experiences along with chapters from her father's book. And they often parallel each other. So things that were happening in her father's book are happening to Maggie in the present day as well. And I thought that just added such a level of creativity and engagement to the story overall. And it was actually to the point where I couldn't like disconnect her father's book from her experiences because he had actually included so much in the book that was actually true. And it was lining up so well with Maggie's experiences. So you are really wondering what is actually happening in this house. So I thought that again, very atmospheric, very well plotted, extremely compelling and engaging. And you just want to keep turning the pages. And ultimately I had a great time with this. I know that a lot of people were really, really disappointed in the ending of this story. And I guess I can see why, but it really didn't bother me nearly as much as the ending as some of his other books that I've already discussed. So I think that this is a great book to go into if you are looking for those vibes, the haunted house atmosphere, not really knowing whether it's paranormal or not. I gave this a solid four, 4.5 stars. And this is definitely one of my top Riley Sagers. All right. And then my new favorite Riley Sager is actually one of his newest releases. And that is The Only One Left. This was his new release last year. And it absolutely blew me away, y'all. This was probably one of the most twisty thrillers I have ever read in my entire life. And I know a lot of people were kind of put off with that by the end because it was just twist after twist after twist. You were getting full on whiplash by reading this story, but I loved it. I thought all the twists were really creative and clever. And while you might have to suspend your disbelief just a little bit overall, I felt like they really made sense within the context of the story. So this is another one of his fully historical thrillers. It is set in primarily in two timelines. The present day timeline is in the early 1980s and then the past timeline is 1929. So in the 1980 perspective, you're following Kit McDear and she is a home health aide and something pretty tragic happened with her last client and she's really on thin ice with her job. They don't really trust her. And the only placement that she can get is with Lenora Hope at Hope's End, which is a cliffside mansion where Lenora Hope lives and hasn't really left for about 50 years at this point. And it turns out that Lenora Hope's current nurse kind of hastily retreated with no word. She just kind of disappeared. And now they are desperate to get somebody in there to care for Lenora Hope, who is going through some severe medical issues. She's paralyzed on one side. She really can't care for herself. Now, the reason why this is a little bit concerning to Kit is because Lenora Hope has a reputation. And that is because in 1929, she was suspected of murdering her sister, mother, and father in a family massacre. Nobody was ever able to prove that she did it, but basically she has been the main suspect the entire time. And so Kit McDear is very, very nervous about going up there, but she goes up there, she gets to meet Lenora, starts caring for her. And then it seems like Lenora Hope is starting to trust Kit because she wants to tell Kit her story. She wants to actually tell Kit what happened in 1929. And it quickly becomes clear that there's definitely more to the story than a lot of people know. And as she starts to uncover the details of the story, as well as uncover details about the former nurse's disappearance, Kit starts to suspect that Lenora 
I might not actually be telling her the full truth. And so naturally Kit is a little bit worried. She's a little bit scared. And so this is about her journey of uncovering the full truth about what happened in 1929, about what happened to Lenora's current nurse and what is actually going on at Hope's End. And I loved this. The only thing that I'm really comfortable saying about this story and the only thing that I want to say about this story is do not trust anything that you read. Not from Kit because this is another instance where I feel like Kit is the reliable narrator but she is just going based on the information that she is given and none of the information that she has given is the full or complete truth. It was such a crazy wild ride and I enjoyed absolutely every single second of it. Like I said I thought that the twists in here were so incredibly well done. I thought they were clever. I thought that this was a very very well woven and intricate story and I really enjoyed my reading experience of this one and I think that is why this is now my newest favorite Riley Sager because I just thought it was so incredibly well done. All right everybody that is it. Those are my ratings and feelings on every single one of Riley Sager's currently published novels. If you are a fan of Riley Sager please comment down below and let me know what your thoughts and feelings are on his books. Which are your favorite? Which are your least favorite? Have you read all of his books like I have? Do you plan on reading all of his books like I have? I will certainly be reading any release that this man puts out for sure and I definitely plan in a couple of years to come to a revisit to this video to see if my thoughts and feelings have changed or like if any of his future releases have displaced any of the rankings that I've talked about here. I'm very much looking forward to following Riley Sager's career. I just think that he comes up with a lot of creative ideas and even if the execution of the books are not what I want them to be and even if the endings might be a little bit lackluster, I still think for the most part the journey from start to finish is well worth it overall. If you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty but you want to let me know that you were here, go ahead and leave me some kind of spooky stabby emoji of your choice. It doesn't matter to me what you leave and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books featured in the video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.